There are over 35,000 museums within the United States, welcoming over 850 million visitors each year. Did you ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in museums, creating the displays and exhibits we all enjoy? Join us as we explore museums and their exhibits from the inside out. Hi, I'm Leslie Mueller. Welcome to Museum Access, the show that takes you behind the scenes at America's top museums. Today we're in Union, Illinois, at the Illinois Railway Museum, the largest railway museum in the United States. In 1901, a group of 10 men were interested in preserving an abandoned high-speed, lightweight electric car from Indiana. Plans were delayed as car 65 was placed back into service in Iowa during World War II. In 1953, the car was moved to North Chicago, and the journey to establish a museum began. Today, the Illinois Railway Museum boasts 450 pieces of historic railway and transit equipment, 13 storage barns, streetcar loops, restoration shops, and miles of tracks, and much more. Then we'll go behind the scenes to the steam engine restoration shop to learn more about this important piece of America's history. So all aboard for our journey on the tracks of yesterday's railway. This is great, Nick. Here we go. Okay, so what what are we riding here? Well, you're riding in a streetcar that was from the city of Milwaukee. It was built in the early 20s and it operated in Milwaukee from 1958. That was the last year for streetcars there. This particular car was called a lightweight car, believe it or not, uh, as heavy as it is. You didn't want to get hit by it or be in a car that got hit by it. Yeah, that's for but sure. But for its era, you know, this was a modern car because you can see the leather seats. Oh yeah, this is uh, very swank. Very, yeah. very much and very airy. You just put up the windows and you had air conditioning. That's your air conditioning. That was it for the day, for, the, for that era, that's for sure. And they and ran all around the city and all outside. All around the city of Milwaukee, okay. they had a very extensive system. But Milwaukee was just like Chicago. Chicago had the largest streetcar system in the United States of one company. You would think New York would be bigger and all of that, but they were separate companies. So Chicago had over 3,000 streetcars every day on the streets. So what's the big deal about streetcars? They were the buses of the day. And kids rode them to school, mom rode them to go shopping downtown, dad rode them to work. So the streetcars were the buses of the day, and this particular car was a very fancy car for its time. Let's backtrack a little bit. Tell sure. me a little bit more about the museum itself. I know well, we're, we're still on museum property. We correct? are, we yeah. are. How so, many acres is this? Well, there, there's actually over 100 acres, Whoa. but we own about 300 and some odd. I like to call this the miracle on the prairie because uh, they moved here. This is the worst place to move to at the time. And today, it's actually a, a great location oh, yeah. because population has come out. And what happens with stuff like this is that people don't want it in their backyards. They don't want the noise, the smoke, the, the, the traffic, all of that stuff. And we're out here in the country, and we, we moved here in 1964. We actually started running in 1966, our first cars. And now we've got a four and a half mile long run with a one mile streetcar loop, which we'll experience on this car. But I like to call it the miracle on the prairie because uh, when we moved here, we moved uh, 43 pieces of equipment, and now we've got over 450 pieces oh of equipment. Oh my gosh. So the biggest growth has come here at Union. And I know that uh, we'll see the uh, steam locomotive restoration area later, but sure. what else is on site? Electric car restoration area, and then the display barns. We have 3.2 miles of track under roof. So all of this equipment is actually not, or at least 3.2 miles of it, is not being exposed to Mother Nature and all of that. These were just piece tools to be used in their trade. And once they were no longer needed, they scrapped them. 
So, yeah, so the fact that this car would have been scrapped in 1958. Oh my gosh. That's right, and the fact that it's still around today what makes it one of the miracles on the prairie. And I also so. saw there were some, are they railroad crossing signs? Oh or yeah. Signals uh, or what, what is a that? A lot of those are obsolete. You know, technology moves, it's not waiting for us. And so these are all obsolete signals that were used on the, on the railroads. They, uh, uh, the crossing gates, these companies no longer exist that built these back then. Today, it's all done by satellite. Back then, it's it like, is? oh yeah, oh absolutely. Wait, how does that work? Well, it seems to work. Oh, I don't, oh yeah, who cares how it works? That's technology, yeah. you know. <laughs> but back then, all of this stuff that we have here was all hardwired and all of that, and that's all gone. It's like your old telephones. And a lot of our volunteers are actually younger guys, you know, like, like Fred and that who's running this. He never experienced this in real life, these streetcars. But here he is, you know, with it today. Well, it's a great place, though, also to have a, a piece of history like this, yeah. because if it does need repairs, you're not too far from a, a bunch of folks who know how to do that. <laughs> and and but they want to do it. And they want to do it. But I'm, I'm amazed at what the equipment must require to keep these running. Is the equipment, are the tools even still in existence? The tools are, but you have to make the parts yourself with those tools. We, oh. we also save the tools besides the cars to do the work of restoration. So. Well, I have to say, I know when you go to these flea markets and tag sales, you can't get to those boxes of the old tools fast enough because everybody wants them. Right, They're just right. made so much better and they last a hundred years. Well, they weren't electric either. Well, yeah, they, that's they true. They didn't wear out didn't the batteries if your arm that. got tired. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. They did, but yeah. Now tell me a little bit more about the tracks. I mean, I've never understood how they figured out or do you know, how did they figure out where the tracks were even going to be? Well, you know, railroads really started back in the 1820s and through the years you know engineering and people engineered and figured it all out as to how to do it but where tracks were put is where where there used to be trails where people needed to go from city to city from town to town so they were put there just like uh, it, it kind of reminds me of when I was a kid going to college uh, the the engineer said you know he says we build a new building here at the college and we put in the square sidewalks, but we wait and see where the kids walk before we put in the circular ones or the direct route ones that cut across the lawn. Interesting. To, yeah. So they might have done the same thing. Might have done the same thing. <laughs> this is the way that people got from one place to another. There was a demand for hauling freight because you have to remember railroads really, 90% of their income came from hauling freight hauling the goods to the people sure. and 10% really was passengers so that's why today you don't have much passenger service you have Amtrak one company but the private companies are hauling more freight today than they ever did in their history interesting it's, it's amazing with less track less locomotives and less people the railroad industry had six million people during the first world war time working in the railroad industry Today, there's less than 160,000. And yet, they're hauling more freight than ever before. Well, efficiency. So, yeah. Efficiency, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The trains are longer, they're bigger, all of that stuff. Faster. Faster, yeah. and mm -hmm. that came from engineering, from experiences, and that. And so the old stuff is here at the Railway Museum so people can get a, some context as to what things used to be like. What's so amazing to me is I've seen all these families here today in school mm -hmm. groups yeah. and they all seem to, I mean, these kids are running from <laughs> locomotive to locomotive and you can tell sure. they're just having this experiential learning right, uh, right. afternoon and I mean, talk to me about that. This is a well, different kind of museum. <laughs> well, it's, it's really a living history museum when Boy, you think it? about yeah. it because they've seen these in movies, all kinds of movies with cowboys and Indians and all of that yeah. stuff. But here, you actually get onto the real vehicle, and oh, guess what? The vehicle is 90 years old. You know, who can you ride that's 90 years old? Yeah. You know, Grandpa <laughs> can't even carry some kids. But, but this is really a, a living history museum when you look at it, and it's the opportunity to, if you can put yourself back in that era, 
that this is what you rode to go to school, to go shopping, to go to work, this, this particular uh, type of car, and that, as well as the streamlined trains and all of the, all the other things from inner city. See, when you go from town to town, sure, you would ride a streetcar. But if you're going from one city, New York, to Chicago, you're going to ride the big trains. Mm -hmm. You know, the mainline trains, the steam trains, and all of that. Well, how long would it take for a ride, let's say, from New York to Chicago? Well, you know what? Pennsylvania Railroad and the New York Central, back in those days, those companies actually competed for customers. They did it in 16 hours. So they say, they, we can do it in 16 hours. Well, we don't, but they oh, could. They could. Ish, 16 ish? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think today Amtrak is around 19 or 20 hours. But back then, remember, it was very labor intensive. So at these road crossings and junctions, you actually had people sitting there that were throwing switches, that were lining the tracks up, that were doing all of this stuff Whoa. manually Whoa. for this fast train to go through because this was the company's flagship. And they fly the flag, you know, that, of that. So it was kind of interesting days. It, it was a well, different era. How does the Pullman family come into all this? Well, George M. Pullman uh, was a, a car builder. They actually built the railroad cars. Remarkably enough, Pullman also built street cars. He built interurban cars, oh. all of that stuff. Oh. But, but Pullman was very famous because he took a section of Chicago, actually a section of land that was not in the city limits, and he built the utopian village for his workers. And he built this car plant there to build the railroad cars, the village for his workers. He took care of everything for everybody. And so when you talk about the ultimate company town, when you think about coal mines and the company towns, uh, that was Pullman also. It was and people would work for their whole careers there. They, they worked for Pullman. Practically exactly. raised their families. They did. Well, they I know did. you have... He uh, had schools there. He had everything. schools there too? Schools there. You could not have saloons within the town. Yeah, yeah. Pullman, wow. Pullman did not want his workers to be drinking. They had to go across the tracks to the saloon. On the and other the, side of the tracks. On the other huh? side of the tracks. <laughs> and the town was ringed by saloons. Oh yeah, I bet it I bet it was. <laughs> so we'll see we'll see one of these Pullman cars. Oh yeah, today. absolutely. Great, We're great. gonna take you into the, the really fancy one, the the owner's car you might say. Well I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the museum. Oh boy, I tell you what, we're uh, we're gonna show you we're gonna show you some real stuff. Now. Thank you so much. The Illinois Railway Museum's collection has grown to roughly 450 pieces of historic railway and transit equipment. More than four miles of tracks are now undercover, providing protection from the tough winters of northern Illinois and a dry place for preservation and restoration of the museum's historic collection of trains. So what are we standing in front of here? What well, a great... This, this is our latest restoration, which is now nearly complete. It's just waiting for its final test under steam, which... Which will be here on the property. It'll be on the property. Hopefully yeah. within a couple of weeks, we will pull her out, fill her with coal and water <laughs> yeah. and... Um, Say a prayer and push her off. Right? Well, <laughs> it's, it's a little more than a prayer. We. Uh, Steam locomotives are subject to Federal Railroad Administration inspection in considerable detail, so we've had inspectors in several times during the overhaul to, oh, to check particular uh, aspects and make, above all make sure the boiler is safe. First of all, where'd she come from? This locomotive is a rather unusual one. This type of locomotive was used primarily in the lumber industry in the Northwest. This came from um, J. Neal's Lumber up in uh, the Northwest. We've had her since the 70s. She ran quite a lot from the 70s through to the late 90s. Then when she was taken down for overhaul, we discovered a problem with the boiler. Um, so we've had to do some quite significant boiler repairs on her. So there's a cylindrical piece in the front here that looks like it's off-center. Is, is that normal? 
Yes, that's the smoke box at the front of the boiler. It's not normal on most locomotives, but this is a shea. And a shea? A shea. Okay. It's come, the name comes from the patent that was granted for this locomotive. Okay. They were heavily used in the timber industry in the Northwest. Because they were stronger? They had more power? No, or? because they were, well, they are powerful, but they have enormous flexibility. Oh, to? To get, you know, they will. To maneuver those. They, will, they are very slow, but they will run on poor track, winding. They laid relatively poor track amongst the, the woods and these locomotives pulled heavy loads out of the out of the woods to the sawmills the way that they differ from a normal steam engine is that the motor which on a normal steam engine the cylinders are horizontal they drive the wheels directly with a rod mm -hmm. here it's a bit more like a steam car engine the cylinders are vertical and it drives a shaft that runs along the side of the locomotive and drives all the wheels through gears. So this is what's called a geared locomotive and because of this gearing it is enormously flexible. The different groups of wheels can flex up and down sure. side to side and still have full power. But the reason that the boiler is off to one side is that if you look at this machine a large amount of the weight, the motor, the cylinders, the gear, is all on one side. Well, I think if I was the engineer, I would feel safer on a locomotive like this because of its flexibility. Oh, you're absolutely. you're putting a lot of faith in the, in the rails, in the tracks, well, right? <laughs> you, are, you, are, you are, and it was sometimes misplaced. Yeah. The, this, one, this one has another interesting feature that if you look closely at its motor, and compare it to a picture of when it was built, it's not the same. We know that relatively early in its career, oh. it fell over onto this side, suffered damage to the motor, and it had a new motor fitted when it was only a few years old. So and that balance wasn't quite as perfect well, as Well, I'm not sure whether <laughs> it was the thought. balance or yeah. just the fact that the track, because this is not the sort of locomotive that you could speed. Sure, it, uh, sure. It has a total maximum speed of about 13 or 14 miles an hour. This is the cab of the Shea. It's um, nearly complete. This is where all the control takes place when it's in operation. Wow. It, it's, fairly, it's fairly standard for a steam engine, a coal-fired steam engine. Um, where I'm sitting would be the fireman's seat. You're on the engineer's side. And the fireman is the, taking care of the... Yeah. Fire that's in there. Um, What's he putting in? Um, <laughs> this locomotive's had quite a history. A long time it was an oil burner. Now it's a coal burner. I see. Um, so at the back of the cab is a bunker which would contain the coal. The fireman has a shovel which, since it's not in service, isn't here at the moment. Mm -hmm. He's shoveling through the fire hole there. That's not the way it would be in service. Yeah. There's an opening and closing door which will be fitted there at the last minute. But this would still be hot, wouldn't it? it this particular locomotive would be brutally hot oh. because um, it travels very slowly. The, the bigger locomotives on the main line, at least when you're running, you can get a through draft. Yeah. This one, even if you open the windows, if it's running at 10 or 12 miles an hour, you're not going to get much of it. Well, and you're getting heat, I'm sure. From... And it's all in an enclosed box. Yeah. They probably didn't take too much trouble to um, on cooling on this one because, as I said, it spent its life in the timberlands of the Northwest, so not the hottest part of the country. Well, and not so cushy for the engineer or the fireman. It purposely, wasn't a cushy life. but purposely, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you don't want them to fall asleep when they're. You don't want the creature comforts. The key responsibilities of the fireman: maintaining the fire, but also maintaining the water level. These glasses show the level of water in the boiler. The level of water in the boiler on a steam engine is 
absolutely critical because um, if it goes too low within here, the fire burns in a steel box. Whoa. Provided there's water on top of the box, everything is fine. If you let the water level fall below that, the fire is hot enough to, stop, uh, to soften the, the steel of the top of the firebox. So that is uh, a life-threatening incident. Sure. So the fireman's responsibility, the, you know, the engineer will keep an eye on it as well and supervise, but the fireman has the primary responsibility for ensuring that water is injected into the boiler to keep that to a safe level. Yeah. So tell me about this 428. This is huge. Well, it's bigger than the shed, bigger, but yeah, um, yeah. it's relatively small for a mainline steam engine. This one dates back to about 1900, so they became much, much bigger than this by the time you got to the 20s and 30s. This was a Union Pacific locomotive. It has the distinction of being the last steam locomotive to run in service for Union Pacific in the Midwest mm. in the 50s. We got it a while after that. It's been a very long-term restoration project. The more we've dug into it, the more we found that needs Attention. overhaul to yeah, yeah. bring it to a modern standard. And many thousands of man hours have gone into it already. And there's still quite a lot to do. Now, what so, happens when I I see lots of machinery around here. I, I know you have machinists okay. that come in, but what is this piece of equipment behind us? Well, this particular piece is a wheel lathe. The railroad wheels are steel on a steel rail, so they wear and periodically you have to turn them on a lathe to recreate the correct profile to run smoothly on the rails. Uh, wheel lathes are still extensively used, but these, for steam locomotives, are huge machines because steam locomotives, the rod locomotives like 428, have pretty substantial diameter wheels. And this lathe was four steam locomotive driving wheels, so it can turn wheels up to 80 inches in diameter, which is it lifted on a hoist to yes, be brought they, onto the... They're, okay. lift, they're lifted on with a hoist, they're mounted between the faces and then tools. It's, it, it's a conventional lathe just on a huge scale. The sheer power of this one has, is in the process of being rebuilt to do the driving wheels for this locomotive. You know, at the end of the day, steam on the main line ceased in the 50s. So you can be pretty sure that they weren't buying new machines of this type much after the 40s. Oh, I see. So it, it's old equipment that you're mm -hmm. restoring. And um, that in itself takes quite a bit. Sure. But they are unique machines. One of the things that amazed me when I was cleaning this one out was that I found some cuttings in the bed of the machine from when it was last used and the scale of the cutting was the size of my finger. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Little finger, admittedly. But yeah, but that's still. A, that's so you know a, how old that is. Well, yeah. I know how old it is, but the sheer force and power of the machine that it was cutting. Able was, to cut that. Well, you know, and that was obviously what they were routinely cutting. George Pullman, cabinet maker turned building contractor turned industrialist, believed that Americans would enjoy traveling in style and comfort. His personal sleeper car reflected his taste for fine things and shaped America's idea of luxury. In 1865, after the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln, Pullman arranged to have the body carried from Washington, D.C. to Springfield, Illinois in one of his sleeper cars. 
The publicity turned the Pullman sleeper car into an overnight success. They were marketed as luxury for the middle class with first class service. I learned that there's more to see besides trains here. Nick took me through the 1851 vintage East Union Depot. It's the oldest active train station west of Pittsburgh, and it's filled with historic pieces of rail history. Visitors can board historic trains outside the depot and travel the five-mile mainline railroad constructed and maintained by the museum. It's a perfect way to end your visit. It's hard to imagine our country before railroad tracks connected us all. And it's not surprising that the railroad industry was the largest employer in America for many years. I hope you'll have a chance to visit the Illinois Railway Museum to see all of the historic preservation firsthand. Thanks for joining us on Museum Access, where every visit is an adventure. See you next time.